It's a worst top 10 on a worst wrestling show. Oopsie, the worst rapper alive. Oops. Yeah, yeah. Big Max back on the mic like oops. Back on the horse, still jumping through hoops. I'm missing Lincoln Pink, I don't lip sync. Just to be clear, choking isn't my kink, but I do it anyway sometimes, I guess. Gotta laugh now, die later in my times of stress. I'm blessed, feeling good, charged up like a Hadouken. Mota Zitabarakis, see, welcome into the Worst Wrestling Podcast. I am your host with the least, Jack Lusne. We are back with another top 10. This time it is the worst. Hell in a Cell matches. Hopefully you're coming off watching the best Hell in a Cell matches. If not, make sure you catch that video right after that. Just a little bit of housekeeping, guys, before we get into it. Um, Like you noticed probably on the intro, I haven't fixed it. It still says every Saturday at 4.20 p.m. That is now every other Saturday. Uh, Just during the football season, uh, when football is over and I can bring the football shows back down to one a week, I'll bring the show uh, the wrestling show back also to one a week, uh, but for now we are going bi-weekly. But hey, I missed last week. I noticed, y'all noticed, it's been two weeks, so I'm making it up to you guys with a double bonus episode today. Uh, we're dropping again best and worst Hell in a Cell matches on uh, my top 10. Uh, so without further ado, we shall get into number 10, Rusev. Versus Roman Reigns for the U.S. title at Hell in a Cell 2016. This was the first time that the U.S. title was defended inside the Hell in a Cell. Wasn't even that bad of a match, to be perfectly honest with you. The problem with this is it was just largely forgettable. Like, honestly, when I was looking these up, I actually genuinely forgot this match happened. Um, And I think the other part of it is... If you watch the match back, really didn't need to be a Hell in a Cell match at all. In fact, like uh, you can see in the graphic below, the best shot we got was Rusev uh, doing uh, his uh, submission finisher. I forget the name of it now. Uh, In fact, it's been so long. Uh, But his his version of the camel clutch um, using the chain. Like you could have basically done this in a no holds barred match. Uh, Last night I said, there's a million ways you could have done this. Absolutely did not require Hell in a Cell whatsoever. Uh, Purely was thrown in Hell in a Cell because it was at Hell in a Cell pay-per-view, which I think probably the most uh, debatable and controversial part of this top 10 list is that maybe I have a lack of matches from that Hell in a Cell era where they were just really throwing shit against the wall. Like they're, they've got some where it's like John Cena versus like Alberto Del Rios and Dolph Ziggler and some, some like they got some real random ones. They did not make this list, to be honest. Uh, there were other ones that to me were more egregious for different reasons. Um, so, but I think that whole kind of Hell in a Cell era when it became a pay-per-view and not just that it became a pay-per-view, but it was like expected that you were going to have like three Hell in a Cell matches at every Hell in a Cell pay-per-view uh, just felt like a bit much. Um, and, you know, there were some good that came out of that, uh, which, you know, if you watched the top 10 uh, shout out to the Usos and the new day uh, for the tag team championships that came out of that Hell in a Cell era. That was some good that came out of it. This to me was lukewarm at best, uh, and that's why I have it very low. It's at number ten, but uh, to me, if I was ranking, you know, top ten worst and best, again, it's just like with Roman Reigns and Rusev, like you had, you had all the pieces. You know, even for the U.S. Championship, I don't mind that, but it's just like again, it didn't require Hell in a Cell. It was just because it was the Hell in a Cell pay per view. It felt very much throwaway. It feels forgettable. I mean, what do, do you remember? I'm I'm talking to you out there. Do you remember Roman Reigns versus Rusev? Let's get into number nine. The best in the world? Shane McMahon versus The Undertaker at WrestleMania 32. I remember when they announced this. I was like, oh, this is fucking stupid. 
I was not into this match uh, when they announced it. I knew exactly what it was going to be. I think the only argument that you can make for this match, it was, I guess, slightly better than people expected. But to me, it was exactly what I expected. It was not that much going on in the ring. They climb up. Uh, or uh, and ultimately it was just Shane, um, you know, somehow getting Taker on an announce table long enough for him to climb up to the cell and go for the elbow. Uh, but again, seeing Shane dive off crazy things is something I guess, you know, again, it feels weird to say it's a wrestling fan thing, but it's like I'm used to it. You know, I've seen Shane do this a bunch of times. I saw him do it against Big Show uh, at SummerSlam. Uh, that one year, uh, I think it was at SummerSlam when he did it against Show, where Test is holding him. Uh, the other, the one I really remember is the one against Steve Blackman. Uh, that was for sure at SummerSlam. Uh, Blackman's chasing him up. They're climbing like one of the like poles for like the 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 camera shots or the lights or whatever the fuck. It looked fucked. Like he looked so high, like a legitimate like thirty feet in the air. Like it, I was scared for the man and Blackman chases him up with the kendo stick and just snaps. And you just see Shane just literally free float. That one is the one that I always think of when I'm like, Oh my God. And then, uh, and then Blackman follows him with the elbow, but there's also the one uh, against uh, Kane uh, when it was the last man standing and he went off the top of the Titan Tron. He went through the stage like, I've seen this man get killed by Kurt Angle in Street Fight. So, again, it's just, it was nothing new to a longtime wrestling fan. Um, and it just felt like a bit of a throwaway, to be honest. And to have this at WrestleMania, um, was, to me, was just a bit nonsensical. Uh, again, it was like paint by numbers, exactly what I expected. Shane does his thing off the top and uh, ends up losing the match. Cool. Cool story, bud. Speaking of predictable, my number eight, DX versus Legacy in perhaps the most obvious match of all time. This was Hell in a Cell, uh, 2009. Shout out to Cody Rhodes and how far he's come since this match. Um, but yeah, this was very much, again, uh, Cody Rhodes and, uh, uh, fuck, I'm forgetting, uh, DiBiase. Uh, the DiBiase's kid. Uh, I can't even remember the kid's first name right now. Ted, it was Ted DiBiase Jr. Did he just have the same name? Was that it? Yeah, I think so. Bit of a stoner moment right here. Um, but yeah. So like, this was just... <laughs> it wasn't even that bad of a match. I mean, it, you know, uh, Legacy put up a fight. But it's like, look, everybody and their grandmother and fucking... You could have never watched wrestling in your entire life, and you would have flipped this on and been like, oh, yeah, those DX is going to win. Like, this is perhaps the most obvious outcome in the history of professional wrestling, if you actually think about it, of like, because they've had matches like this where it was like Razor Ramon and one, two, three kid, and he pulled out a crazy upset win. And so I guess there's a little bit of that in play, but I don't think there was anybody that thought, in any serious form or fashion that legacy was going to win this match. Uh, and DX did in fact, win this match, very forgettable. Uh, and that's kind of the problem with, uh, some of these Hell in a Cell matches in these next two, um, especially just very forgettable and should not have happened. Quite frankly, uh, we don't have to spend too long here. Number seven, Kane versus mankind on a random episode of raw in August. 24 uh, of 1998. So this is actually crazy if you think about it because the King of the Ring 1998 happened in June. So this is backwards, right? Like you would think that this was the opposite, right? Of where, again, you would think that they had this random Hell in a Cell match between Mankind and Kane on Raw, and they were like, oh, that didn't quite work the way we wanted. Let's run it back at a pay-per-view, maybe with Undertaker, and you get the match. No, this was backwards. Hell in a Cell at King of the Ring had already happened. And so, like, two months later, Vince booked a Hell in a Cell match on Raw between take uh, Mankind and Kane. 
what? What the actual fuck? So obviously this was just a like basically a throw in a throwaway hell in a cell match that didn't make a lot of sense and didn't have any of the spectacle of the first one that people had just seen two months prior where Mick Foley damn near fucking killed himself in the same match. So it's like, you can't have the same match on TV two months later and have people expect to get less than they got the last time. So it's like, unless mankind actually fucking died in this match, there was no way to top the previous one that had been two months ago. What the actual fuck? Sometimes people don't act like, you know, the Attitude Era was, uh, Vince was just shitting gold bricks and never made fucking mistakes and stupid decisions. It's like, here we go. Uh, actually, no, it's just that, you know, things were so chaotic back then and we didn't have this, like, mass media of, especially online media where we were following and nitpicking their every fucking move. Um, like, this just kind of flew under the radar. I don't think, I think most casual wrestling fans have no idea this match even exists to be quite frank. Uh, and I think that's the same thing with this next match. <laughs> Stone Cold, Steve Austin, and The Undertaker team up to take on uh, Mankind and Kane. This was again in 1998. So Vince was just obsessed with throwing together random Hell in a Cell matches in 1998. And this one again... This was, I at least, okay, so this one at least kind of made some sense, I guess, because this one was just before King of the Ring. So the last one, Kane vs. Mankind, that was on August 24th, 1998. That was about two months after the King of the Ring, uh, 1998, which happened on June 28th, okay? So here's the timeline, essentially, for these, for six, seven, and the greatest Hell in a Cell match of all time. So you have the greatest Hell in a Cell match of all time, wrapped by two of the shittiest Hell in a Cell matches of all time. Think about that for a second. Uh, next time you're thinking Vince was just some fucking brilliant genius back in the 90s doing everything right. Um, again, very character driven. I think uh, people forget a lot of the bad and just remember. You know, it's funny because usually it's the opposite. Human nature is to remember the bad and kind of forget the good. And somehow with the attitude there, it's been the opposite where it's like a lot of us, it feels like we remember just the good stuff. And we don't remember a lot of this dog shit in between unless you were just like actively there the whole time. So, again, let's get into this timeline because this is actually fucking insane if you think about it. So. On, on a Monday Night Raw on June 15th, 1998, they have a random Hell in a Cell match between Stone Cold and The Undertaker uh, versus Mankind and Kane. All right. So that, what did we say that was? Uh, fucking memory again. June 15th. Okay. June 15th. 13 days later. All right. That means... There was one more Monday Night Raw, and then we got King of the Ring, where they were already, I guess, was, I'd have to look back in history, I guess, and see, like, how quickly did that get put together, that Hell in a Cell match? Or was that already, like, planned? And then, if that's the case, why the fuck would they do it on Monday Night Raw two weeks before in a random throwaway tag team match? What was going on? <laughs> um, again, I was only eight years old, so I don't remember actively, like, exactly what happened there um that would be kind of interesting to look at but anyways so so you have the random throwaway tag team hell in a cell taker stone cold versus mankind kane 13 days later you have the greatest hell in a cell match that's ever happened and then two months later you have this random throwaway uh again hell in a cell match with kane and mankind it's like what the fuck dude all right Let's get into number five. The Big Boss Man versus The Undertaker. So this one, I think, actually um, might be conflicting. I think this one might be the most controversial on the list because you see the, the image on the left of Boss Man hanging. I think that is something that is a very jarring image that people 
either remember as something positive or negative, right? Uh, so like maybe you remember that in the sun, in the context of, oh, that was way too much for me. Or I, I that's, you know, that was stupid. That's not professional. Or blah, blah. Maybe that's the way that you view that. Okay. That's one context. The other context though, from an entertainment aspect, from a, a theatrical aspect, again, getting in that Vince McMahon crazy booking world and mindset, I can see where some fans would actually remember this positively. Um, the reason I have it on this list is because if you were to go back and watch the actual match itself, this kind of plotting, quite frankly, wasn't the greatest. And really the best, like the best spot, and this is Vince McMahon booking 101. The match itself ultimately did not matter. It was all about this spot and this image and and getting that image of boss man hanging from the cell um that was the moment right and vince throughout uh his personal history has said even um you know he prefers booking huge moments as opposed to like um these like long-term storylines that's more of like triple h's thing to be honest um, but he's more of just like a big moment guy. And you talk about, I could see him really being like, oh, and they have a match. And after the match, Undertaker has boss man hanging by his neck, by his neck from the cage. Like I could just, oh my God. So again, I think this is one of those things where you're either going to remember it one way or the other, where I could understand how that's such a stark and lasting image that you might remember it positively. But I think in neutrality and with the benefit of hindsight, this belongs on the list of top 10 worst hell in a cell. Uh, but the next four for me, these are, these were actually pretty easy for me, and two of the top three involved two of the same people. But before we get to that, let's stop off at number four, CM Punk. And this was a dumb one. This was a, a, a handicap match, I guess, with Ryback and Paul Heyman, from what I understand. So <laughs> historically, I think wrestling fans by now know that CM Punk and Ryback uh, – Yes, they had a feud. They fucking hated each other. CM Punk especially uh, hated Ryback. Um, and I think based on the interactions that most fans have had with Ryback, uh, especially if you uh, partake in the Twitterverse, understandable. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, this match was just a clusterfuck. The whole, the whole idea of the match was just Punk trying to get his hands on Paul Heyman, which is like... Again, this just didn't need to be Hell in a Cell. And it's like um, Hell in a Cell, theoretically speaking, like should be reserved for like, you know, either just like the crazy spectacles or blow off matches like blood feuds, um, because it's a it's an escalation in events. And uh, again, just throwing in. This, again, the idea that like uh, CM Punk wouldn't even necessarily be focused on his opponent in the actual Hell in a Cell match, even though theoretically you could argue, well, Paul Heyman is one of the opponents, um, and so it would be good strategy for him to like chase him down. It's like, yeah, but uh, that's not the the storytelling that they were going with this, and this was just in an era of wrestling where I got to tell you, my interest. Uh, was waning thin, uh, and you know, so a lot of times I think I was taking long, uh, extended absences from uh, enjoying wrestling of this era. But man, this this was just uh, a complete fucking. Again, what I hate is throwaways. When you take a stipulation like a Hell in a Cell, which is something that should be treated with a level of fervor and urgency, um, and again, to just treat it so flippantly, I think is it it cheapens the match and it cheapens it cheapens the the aura of uh, of what it's supposed to be and this was just honestly dog shit booking is what it comes down to number 3 this one uh this one is one of that I take personally <laughs> uh Dean Ambrose versus Seth Rollins uh this was in uh this was at Hell in a Cell 2014. So this is only one year removed 
uh, from the CM Punk Ryback stuff uh, with Paul Heyman, which um, again, it, it's funny because this was something that I remember actively drawing my interest in bringing me back in the fold as a wrestling fan uh, when the shield broke up and the feud specifically between Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose. Now, it doesn't get referenced the same way because obviously Dean is now John Moxley in AEW and they more reference the feud, um, the extended feud over years following the breakup that Seth Rollins has had with uh, Roman Reigns. But I I think people kind of forget, coming out of the Shield breakup, the actual feud of Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins was hot as anything there was going on in professional wrestling at that time. Uh, and especially they escalated when Seth Rollins would then curb stomp Ambrose threw some cinder blocks on Monday Night Raw. And this was something, this was a level of kind of chaos and, and violence that was frankly missing from the product since like the Attitude Era. And I think that's when people lament, um, I think the PG era versus the Attitude Era, um, I think it gets kind of conflated with certain people obviously are talking about like the sexual aspects of WWE and what it was back then. But I think more true wrestling fans are actually talking about kind of the level of destruction and violence that we were blessed with um, in the nineties. And not that these guys should be out here taking, I'm not advocating in any way for these guys to be out here taking unprotected uh, chair shots or anything like that. But I love creative spots that look menacing, but actually are relatively safe for the worker. Um, so just to give a, a completely separate example here, um, the, the fatal four-way at SummerSlam between Braun Strowman, Brock Lesnar, Samoa Joe, and Roman Reigns. That match had a bunch of spots, like when Braun picks up the office chair and whips it at them. Uh, or uh, when Braun picked up the announce table even and flipped it over on Brock Lesnar. Like, those spots look like a million dollars, but in reality are relatively safe for the work. Like, the announce table, I know it's heavy, but it's Brock Lesnar can bench more than probably what I'm assuming that that announce table weighs and even if he can't like it's a flat surface that kind of like again it'll spread the weight across so it's not like he's dying under there you know what i mean like and the same thing with the office chair it's like yeah the taking the padded office chair if you get at the wrong angle might hurt but ultimately it's not going to break bones or anything but it looks fucking amazing so again some of these i love spots like that and so the cinder block spot was exactly in that mode of like, oh, that looks like it fucking killed the dude. You know it didn't, but it looks like it did. Um, and so, again, the build up, the lead, the feud, the Hell in a Cell match, all of it was so fucking good. This should be on the list of top 10 best Hell in a Cell matches. But unfortunately, the booking at the end, Bray Wyatt coming in and taking a huge dump on this match and this feud. And just, again, it was completely unnecessary. It was completely unneeded. And it it really ruined a good thing. And it, it ruined a good thing in two ways. Not only did it ruin that match, it ultimately ruined that feud because Dean Ambrose was immediately spun off into a feud with Bray Wyatt that was lacking, if anything. It was all ultimately just uh, kind of a cheap way out to get Ambrose back on SmackDown booking essentially because they were still very much trying to keep the shows and brands separate at that point. Um, and instead of acknowledging that they kind of exist within the same universe, you would see it sometimes and they go away from it. And it was just fucking again, such a, a mess of how they, they booked that shit. And so again, to have Bray Wyatt, who was just completely fucking uninvolved. That was the thing. It was like, there was not a single fucking goddamn reason for him to come out and, and cost Dean Ambrose this match other than 
like the from the writer's director point of view to be like, oh, we need to spin this off into a different feud now. And I really like because look, I I'm not a professional writer by any means, guys, but I do write as a hobby. I've written my entire life. There are certain very loose and basic rules of writing that you just can't fucking ignore. And one of the things that drives me nuts is when you establish characters in a universe, you can have characters break rules, but to, to have them do so flippantly and without reason essentially is just taking away again from the aura. It's like earlier what we were talking about with the throwaway Hell in a Cell matches. It's like if you just abuse these these story beats and just have them be meaningless in the way that they are written, then that's the way that they will be perceived. So again, it takes away from the meaning of what you're trying to actually build to. Um, and can anyone remember the feud really from uh, Dean Ambrose and Bray Wyatt? Like, no, it was, a, again, a throwaway ultimately. And I think the fact that that feud just kind of spun off into just other random bullshit and ultimately led to Dean Ambrose's departure from the company, I, in my estimation, like, yeah, I think this was a horrendous horrendous booking call that ultimately ruined what could have been again an all-time match in an all-time feud at number two <laughs> the usual suspects we got the same two fucking guys seth rollins and uh bray wyatt aka the fiend this was at hell in a cell 2019 i understand exactly what they were going for in this match it just doesn't play in professional wrestling and especially again this is one of those things where you have pre-established rules when you have written an existing universe okay so just to give uh, an example okay if i was Hired tomorrow to write for Batman, okay? Batman is a character that already exists in a world, in a universe that already exists. There are certain rules and parameters that if I break those, I have to almost bring the audience in on the joke with me Otherwise, it just looks like I'm shitting on the canon or don't know it or I'm just, you know, again, it's one thing to say I am taking existing characters and doing my own version with it. It is another to just, again, flippantly ignore, you know, very basic premises of characters and worlds that have already been built over time. So when you talk about professional wrestling, Again, something as easy as the rules of the match, I think, is a very debatable thing in professional wrestling. Like, the rules of the match can very much change in flux, but there are still certain things, right? One, two, three equals a pinfall, right? We all know that. Um, a person tapping out is a submission. Uh, that's a victory. You know, again, there are certain immutable facts uh, within the world of professional wrestling. One of those immutable facts is that a Hell in a Cell match is no disqualification and there's no fucking like ending it because, oh my God, that move was just too brutal, guys. Um, so like, again, the whole idea that they tried to enact and emulate within this match was the idea of bringing to life a horror movie within the Hell in a Cell match. And again, the idea was there, but what they did was they flippantly ignored the existing parameters of the Hell in a Cell. When you have the match end because Seth Rollins uh, hits the fiend on, on the head with all the tools on him or whatever, whatever, or the ref stops him uh, and, and ends the match for that, 
again, you are flagrantly and flippantly and dismissively ignoring the preconceived rules of the match. So me as a fan, me as a, 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 a person being entertained. So whether that was a, you could talk, this is very general now, whether this is as a reader uh, uh, or a viewer or just any person consuming entertainment, there is a level of suspension of disbelief that I can afford you going in. That means that right away going in, I can be like, there are certain things that I'm just going to ignore. Like, uh, just to give you kind of an idea, in an action movie, right, the, the good guy goes in, there's a hundred guys shooting at him, he somehow doesn't get shot, and he kills a hundred bad guys. I can suspend my logic of obviously that's dog shit, and you know what I mean? Like, again, I'm, a, I'm allowing you certain suspensions of logic already. In professional wrestling, I am already allowing you a huge gap of suspension of logic. So when you disrespect that and you then take it to that next level of, okay, now you're just treating me like I'm a fucking idiot. Like that's just bad booking. And that's what this match ended up being. Um, and again, really they should have, they could have done like the whole thing almost exactly as was except you just have to have Seth commit to committing that act of violence. It's enough for him to get the pin one, two, three, and you still have Bray, uh, Bray Wyatt raise up after like you, this was this close to actually being really good. And they just completely fucked it up quite frankly, by ignoring the basic rules of writing and world building. So just a lesson for you guys out there. Um, if you're a hobbyist or if that's something that you partake in, I think when you, again, when you build that world over time and you build that universe over time, you can you can absolutely have things go against logic, but they have to be done in a way that is uh, cathartic and logical within the framework of the universe that you've set up for the the, the person that is supposed to be entertained and consuming what it is that you are creating. So just a uh, food for thought, but yeah, ultimately getting, I know I got a little bit long winded and existential there, but it's cause again, the, I think this one really came down to the storytelling of the match and the way that they, again, ignored the parameters of the world that they have set up in WWE as professional wrestlers and entertainers. And this last one here, number one on the list for me, uh, far and away, this is, easy. again, you just can't have this kind of bullshit. This is the complete, this, again, everything a Hell in a Cell match is supposed to fucking be, this was not. It was Braun Strowman versus Roman Reigns, Hell in a Cell 2018. Um, and again, just... The fact that Braun cashed in to be able to get this match, one of the few times, too, that the guy cashed in ahead of time, which I actually enjoy. Um, I, I think that's something that doesn't get done enough uh, in, in WWE is I, when a guy just cashes in by straight up asking for a very specific match. So Braun Strowman cashing in, asking for Hell in a Cell. I thought was great booking. Um, it was a little bit overdone. They brought in special guest referee Mick Foley for this, which, you know, homage to the Hell in a Cell, and I get it, but just felt completely unnecessary. Um, and then, man, what a dog shit ending. I mean, the match itself was fine. Brock, uh, Brock, uh, Braun and Roman, I actually really enjoyed their feud. The, I'm not finished with you, like that that shit actually popped me a lot. And I thought they had a great uh, feud and set of matches. Uh, the ambulance match specifically stands out as one of my favorites, but this one to have Brock Lesnar, which I said his name by accident before, basically this was, you know, Braun versus Roman. And then Brock Lesnar just decides to come down uh, 20 minutes in kills them both uh, leaves them wrecked and leaves. And it's a no contest. 
Ah! God fucking damn it. Are you kidding me? Are you fucking kidding me? Literally, again, everything a Hell in a Cell match is supposed to be keeping everybody else out and keeping this a one-on-one contest, and there is no way that this can end in a no contest. That's like the most basic parameters of the match. And it wasn't like they, they did it in a way, again, that was like super creative and like with going within the logic of the universe of like, oh, well, Brock was able to having like, there was no reasoning. It was just fuck you. <laughs> it was straight up. That's Vince McMahon just fuck you booking of I don't I need Roman to keep this title. Can't have Braun take it right now. Uh Brock's just gonna go kill them both. Fuck it. So fucking ugh. Ugh. gotta be easily the worst Hell in a Cell match that's ever happened. Um, but yeah, that's it for me for Hell in a Cell matches. So again. We just dropped top 10 worst Hell in a matches. If you missed it, you can go catch the top 10 best Hell in a matches. We will be off next week, but we will be back the following week uh, with a brand new top 10 episode. Or maybe I'll check in on the actual wrestling world. Who knows? Uh, but we'll figure something out for you guys in a couple of weeks. But until then, you got a couple episodes to take in. So thank you guys so much for joining. And until the next time. I'll catch all of you guys on the flip side. My positive contact results in affirmative impact. Never pull the rise on raps. I'm never primitive, but cannibalistic, vicious. Characteristics, I read the different potency. Epicetic genes, yo. Amber the HMCs, that extraordinary speed. Some of the beers like, some of the razor blades and grease in your bare feet. I see your fucking colleagues misprize you very much to your dismay. So today, I can say you won't be running away. Hold your tail between your legs. I'm gonna advocate when you fail below stakes. I'll take a hacksaw to you, cockeyed mumble rap slack jaws. Leave you shredded on a side like some coleslaw. The double time with the clothesline from hell. Like Bradshaw, I'm toxic like septic shot. A dying breed like anorak.